For many reasons, I am thankful for the family I grew up in. No person is perfect, nor family free from trials. But it was clear in our household that God's Word was the foundation for all things. For that home, our code of conduct was clear. That everything we do, we should strive to honor God. Period, exclamation mark. So we are to be as conscientious and consistent as possible in letting the wisdom of the word develop our character, as Lucian said this morning, our influence and our conduct, and direct our decisions because our purpose is to live for him. And on that note, if this window is activated, as I've seen some blips, let's review, yes, this key question. What are a Christian's rights, responsibilities, roles, and limits relating to our government? And to help our discernment in this, let's study the Word. And let's acknowledge some of the principles and foundational truths found there within. I will pause until the screen is fully activated. Drama, pause for effect, right? First observation, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. Our primary citizenship is in heaven. Thank you, Russ, for the reading of that powerful passage. Our primary citizenship is in heaven. Against all the evils that we see and that we put up with by course of living in this life, cursed by sin that we welcomed in and became accountable for, don't ever forget that we are heaven bound. Peter would encourage us in the same in his first epistle. He said in chapter 2, We are sojourners. We are aliens just traveling through a foreign country. Planet Earth is not our country. It's not our home. And as the world has gotten more, well, as we have seen it become more ungodly, I think that we feel this more intensely. We, as citizens of heaven, are simply living here first. And I'm looking forward to heaven more as the days go on. This fact, by the way, when people say, remember, Jesus is still king, it it has almost an effect that is not intended if we're not careful to keep it in check and balance. This fact doesn't justify any worldly behavior on our part. Nor does it excuse not paying attention to the issues of the day. Quite the contrary. We may not like it, but it may not be pleasant, but the fact that we are heaven citizens, that our citizenship is in heaven, behooves us to best represent the God of heaven while we are here. It's easy uh, to see all the issues of our day and frankly feel overwhelmed, discouraged, distraught, disillusioned. But our focus goes back to Jesus. Our mission is simple. Show and tell others how Jesus is the answer. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. That passage implies, and we can glean from it, that we are ambassadors for Christ as we represent our King, yes, in all things. In this sin-loving world, we are his disciples. That means we learn of him so that we can follow him. And as we do, we get closer to him and become more like him. We are his disciples. We are also his ambassadors. That means we speak for him. We represent him in all things. As a Christian, I'm always concerned about the religious freedoms in this country. That is a major battle in this cultural war. 
I pray that Oak Hill is always so strong and professes the portions of Scripture that public pressure and even some laws may currently counter. The Word speaks of being legal, but how do we reason this against laws that say to stay silent? Jesus would teach in Matthew 10, 16, to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's a passage often quoted. I was intrigued to go back into its context and see that it's being bold in the face of opposition while you represent him. It's going to happen. That's what we have to do. So, may our God be pleased with every decision we make along the trials that are unique to us. With every test we encounter, may we please the Lord by how our conduct and words are. We think about Peter. When he was referenced as well this morning in class, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And in my words, slightly altered from the text to emphasize, he says, uh, If it comes down to choosing between these so-called religious leaders and to choose to obey God, it's going to be God. And I hope that we are so resolved to be that way. To have the Lord speak our name before the Father, Matthew 10, 32. We must not be ashamed to speak His name to the world. Jesus wisely said in John chapter 18, verse 36. John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. You know, so glad he said that. Issues are so important, and yet they can sidetrack us. They can blind us. This fact will keep our focus where it belongs. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. I referenced the disclaimers I mentioned earlier. That doesn't mean we are to ignore the issues of the day, but represent God in this day. I'm thankful there will be no elections, no earthly elections in heaven because His saints, His redeemed saints are happy to let King Jesus rule that eternal day as well as it should be. But we live in the here and now. What about the present? I include Psalm 33 verse 12 because I think of it. How very blessed is the nation, any nation who seeks the Lord. We strive to influence, appreciate that, uh, appreciate that emphasis of the word influence today in class. We strive to influence the things that we know are beyond our control. And yet we know certain things are within our control, namely our faithfulness, our conduct, our influence to, the, to others as we represent the Lord. That's within our control. So let's bring this personal. Here's the question. Do we seek to please Him in all matters? John's first epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, would imply that to those of us who are heaven-bound saints, those of us who have been redeemed, says that since we, the redeemed, will be resurrected to see the Lord as He is, that fact ushers us into this application Be diligent, therefore, to live like Him now. The implication is to keep being more like Christ, representing Him more fully and accurately in all things. That's how we influence the world. As we evangelize the lost, let's strive to help everyone see, yes, at every level of society, that Jesus is the answer. Not to be shunned from the public arena, but the very foundation of it. That perspective will influence our discernment and all of our efforts. Having stated that, there is a second implication or an observation just from Scripture as a whole. Some verses referenced. I am biblically bound to cooperate, participate in matters of government. And here's the kicker. As long as it does not conflict or supersede my faith. That says a lot. That's a statement of faith itself that others are opposed to. But having said that, I say this because Jesus is still our Lord in 2024. And He will be in 2025 and beyond. 
If our government or if the government does not conflict with or supersede my faith, I have a God-given instruction to be supportively involved. We often ignore that fact in stating the other, but that's a balanced checkpoint we need to emphasize. These verses list some examples, such as specifically taxes. The superior teaching in Matthew twenty-two twenty-one is to give to God our very soul because it bears his image, right? Yet, Jesus sets the standard when he says, this coin is Caesar's. <laughs> it's obvious. Give it to him. Give to Caesar what is his. The just debate of our day <laughs> might be something like this. How much of the coin or how much of the dollar is the government or the worker entitled to? Now, no doubt there's much corruption and room for improvement on that. But taxes by themselves are not a sin, and my Lord says I'm obligated to pay them. Romans 13 teaches that all governments have authority delegated by God, and ideally, verse 4 would apply to all, <laughs> that the one who bears the sword for the state is a minister of God. Wow. Now, just as any home may not please God by the decisions that are made, not all governments may always honor God by the choices made, but they do have authority. And I must fund those who administer justice and keep order and peace. Another example involves or concerns whether a Christian can employ the rights afforded by the government. This is interesting, and it's a challenge for some. Let's consider Paul for this. I'm aware, I'm not unaware, that Paul had a unique mission, divinely appointed, and so some of the occasions he faced while on that mission, he was to fulfill what God had desired. And so he, he made certain decisions, and therefore, let's spotlight those decisions. In Acts 16, 37, Paul exercised his rights as a Roman citizen to prevent an unlawful beating and undo one at that. Later, in Acts twenty two twenty five, Acts twenty two twenty five, he was about to face another beating, and he stopped it by letting them know he was a Roman by birth. In Acts twenty five, Paul's desire to take the gospel to Rome resulted in him motivating a, a use in the judicial system when he appealed to Caesar. And so in those moments, he took advantage of the rights that were afforded to him. And I caution us to say, Christians should not be selfish, but to have God's interest truly at heart in choosing to use available means or benefits as necessary or to God's glory. Very careful to have checks and balances on that. Well, that being stated, hope that helps. Let's move to the next. Another example involves praying for our leaders. We're up to verses, well, we're up to 1 Tim, uh, Timothy chapter 2 and Titus chapter 3. They, referring to those in elected offices and officials like this, they are in crucial position. Their decisions affect our lives. Their decisions affect the world. And with the problems of our day, with threats against all things good and godly, they need to seek God's way. But people have free will. And some hearts are calloused against letting any perceived objective or professed objective moral values influence their decision. Morality is shunned by many in high positions. So not every member of government prays for God's wisdom. Therefore, Christians will pray for God to work as only He can to influence, to guide, and providentially provide. But what if I have influence over that? That's a question we'll answer in a minute. Even if my entire being stands for everything they are against and against everything they are for, my prayers for them must remain constant. Perhaps it's felt more intensely when, and praying more fervently when, we know, 
that they are not seeking God's will. Even if it gets worse for people of faith, we must pray and trust. On that note, a few bonus thoughts on persecution. We had a lesson recently on this, but there were some things I did not mention. I hope that we naturally care of how the government sees people of faith, strictly because we elevate it above rules that may counter our faith, and because opposing government could bring serious consequence. I hope not for persecution. I know that benefits come from that. I observe how people are, and I accept those facts. But is it possible to maintain evangelistic fervor without it? I would hope so. I can say factually, I personally don't think persecution is required to be faithful, but it's obvious that those threatening situations do have a way of testing and developing our resolve. I again would say that personal life in this world brings enough trial and temptation to develop that resolve and faithfulness. Still, If we go through any more such hard times, we would best relate to and glean more encouragement from accounts like Daniel who resolved to pray to God as he always did, even if he'd be eaten alive and torn limb from limb. And those who would not of his friends bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. We would also be so encouraged And look up to the role models of people like Peter and John in Acts 5, 29, who told those Sanhedrin what they thought about their threats. With all the love that our Lord modeled, though, we have to be strong in truth, live out our faith, while submitting to the authorities as Christ commands. Romans 13, 1 through 3. May not always be easy. This portion now concluded. Let's continue the wrapping up of this lesson and look at more application point by point. Some ways that a Christian must and even some ways that a Christian can participate, participate in governing affairs. Our premise is that I can and maybe even must participate and cooperate in the activities of governing affairs and authority as long as it does not conflict with my faith. And and specifically, I'll mention again, taxes. Should a Christian pay taxes? That's an issue for some. Well, but actually this is an easy one because we've already addressed it. You'd better. (laughs) You'd better. I'll editorialize just a little bit. I do wonder sometimes if people realize how much they pay and what differences there would be with that knowledge, quite frankly. Uh, I know exactly how much I do, at least in income tax. I remember trying and praying to have the right attitude in my heart when I would have to write out my quarterly taxes. And so uh, when I had to write it out on check, I, um, I would add a little note and seal it in the envelope. And it would say, please wisely use my earned funds for some good cause. And I just know that made the day of the person who opened that envelope. I just know it. That being stated, moving on to the next, what about voting? Should a Christian vote? I've read some interesting comments on this from some people all across the board. And I'll say some things this way. We are citizens of a representative form of democratic government. That was unheard of in the New Testament times. There was no campaigning over or for an issue. There was no peaceful protesting against some decree, whether it was a monarchy, a Roman controlled, or some authoritarian government. The people had no choice, no voice. You obey or die. And the inspired writers wisely encouraged the obedience to authorities. And from the right perspectives, with the right spirit, such as reverence, as we discussed, That timeless principle would be written in the scriptures if inspired and written today, I should say, if written today. But scripture was, was completed long ago, and it's silent on this issue. Maybe that's a good thing. And we have to then conjecture. Here is how I have reasoned. It is an incredible blessing to have some say or influence in our government by casting a vote. 
And it therefore needs to be as informed and prayerfully matured and discerned as possible. I rejoice in having a vote. And I pray that its power is never minimized or eliminated, as is a serious concern today. Because many people have so many ungodly agendas, they will certainly cast their vote. They hope I do not cast mine. And if my faith-based convictions have an equal voice... I'll happily assist righteousness on that battlefield. I'll promptly mention what so others speak so long to emphasize and just get this point across. We are not to think that we win people to Christ by casting a vote. That's not evangelism. And yet our elected officials have large influence over the philosophies and lifestyles of society and how they view things godly. My conviction, therefore is that this ability, this present ability to vote, becomes my accountability. So I take it seriously and desire to vote as often as I know and possible. But my mission remains the same, to point people to Christ at all times. That's what we need to do. And the influence is affected. Third question. Let's go to the third question briefly. Can a Christian run for office? I've heard some interesting ones on this over the 25 years of time. Interesting, you know, I call it those, uh, what do you call it, those, uh, those uh, 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 porch swing conversations where you just visit someone and they'll tell you what they think. Uh, votes are private, by the way, and I'm freely happy to share that uh, it was a joy to see uh, among our own number uh, a, a certain Christian's name on the ballot for a particular role and function. I'm just going to say that. But I was told a long time ago something like this. Government's too corrupt for a Christian. Don't send them there or else they will change and become lost. Spare their soul and don't vote for them. Wow. Wow. Well, my brain hurts to try to think that way, frankly. I, it just hurts. I know, I respect opinions, but I, I do like to discuss and reason. So God can work His providential wonders, and that's why we pray. But I don't underestimate what God can do more so through those who are truly seeking His way. May, that may not be our role or course to decide in life. That may, that may not be what we want to do. But if a Christian decides to do that, to respect that decision, and maybe even support it, I align my thoughts more with what Charles Finney would write and so often say. Quote, The ungodly will not run a nation by godly principles. I wouldn't expect them to. A nation can't be blessed apart from God's principles. So, if his people aren't involved... Neither are his principles. As he speaks generically, of course, I then also do the same principally. America needs more representatives at every level who examine their issues from a Christian perspective. If such Christians are suited for the role and well suited, qualified, and they desire it, they just might get my vote. And if it's okay to vote for a Christian to an office, then it would be okay for a Christian, even you, to run for an office. Interesting, isn't it? We certainly need positive influence. Whenever someone says, oh, I'm going to college, what's your major? And they say this or that. And my answer is always the same, and I am genuine every time I say it. Well, we we certainly need good people in that field. That's so true. Next question, briefly. Can I lawfully protest? Either a law, a ruling, or an ordinance. You know, this is interesting. There are laws that allow it, thankfully, but without breaking a law or even divine reprimand, Paul protested an illegal beating. That sticks in my mind. And so it appears that you can civilly dispute something in ways that maintain honor within the bound of law and no harm at all. Represent Christ in all things, remember? And now the fifth question. Principle. Should my vote be influenced by the candidate's principles, philosophies, character, and morality? Well, my short answer is, well, yes, of course. Above all credentials required, character is key. 
There will always be accusations and misrepresentations in any political campaign. And so I pray for myself and others to have wise discernment at all times. No one person will ever meet my full preference. Jesus is king in heaven. We get that point. But I can consider all that is important and that I deem special to me that aligns with the options available. There are many more issues than one or two. Here's an illustration that might help. I played marbles as a kid. Not the circle one. That was a couple times. But where marbles would be lined up, you'd use a, a larger marble to roll and knock off the opponent's marbles. That was fun. But the circle one outside, you might remember that. I want you to think of all of your values, everything you know and everything you've researched and everything you believe. I want you to take everything you are metaphorically and imagine it being a big bucket of marbles. Some heavier, some more important than others, but all those values, everything you are, a bucket of marbles. And then pour them into a funnel to be sorted, sifted, and collected. And then step back and observe how the scales tilt. And your convictions. In that old game of marbles I referenced, the larger ones were called many things by different people. I researched it, but I called them mashers. I called them the mashers. Those were the ones right there. And those were the larger, most important issues. You needed that. Take special note of where those mashers land in your filtering process. Obviously, some of my mashers uh, wouldn't apply Uh, to either case, but many of them do, and those that did get filtered get sifted and all collected. I always consider, here's one, I'll mention only one right here. One masher is who will represent or at least respect my Christian convictions and not advance any agendas that would thwart my practice of them. Uh, Many of my mashers, the ones that remain, are quickly sorted, sifted, and collected with the answering of this question here. Sixth point. When casting a vote, should I strongly consider the candidate's record on any issue that is addressed biblically? Well, there you go. As an ambassador for Christ, I just can't imagine... First of all, being at odds with my Lord and then saying, stay out of this, Jesus. On any issue, he clearly teaches. No, the family I grew up in made it clear that God's word was the standard and foundation in this home and for my life. And it is too, by the wisdom of the word, influence my discernment and affect my decision in all things. If I'm wanting to please the Lord in all things, I've got to take this as seriously as well. Because godliness, righteousness will exalt a nation. But sin is a disgrace, it is a reproach, and it is a shame to any people. Proverbs 14, 34. And no matter how this election goes, I think that with the next Sunday service potentially planned, this would be my only chance to speak in such ways as this. No matter how this election goes, I take immense comfort in knowing that Jesus is my king and I will spend eternity with him. I want an easier life while here, of course. I want the blessings as best as possible. But I look forward to being in a land where Jesus is king and only righteousness rules that eternal day. I hope that you, thank you, I hope that you choose to be a citizen of the Lord's perfect kingdom. And we've had so many choose that most important decision in life. That's a great commitment to enter the covenant of the Lord, and we represent Him in all things. If we have faith in the Lord, we will do what He says, right? Well, He's encouraged us to put Him on in baptism so that He can honor that faith response by washing away our sins and allowing us in the power of His presence and His Word to live for Him, representing Him in all things. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Represent Christ at everything that you do, and people will see. That's within our influence, and we hope to have even more as the days go on. 
If you need to put Christ on in baptism, let us know. Let us assist you as we stand and as we sing.